Okay, let's start this. So, good morning, everyone. Good evening to others. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to IOM's live session, Protecting Migrant Workers Across Supply Chains Through Blockchain. My name is Tara, and I am so very grateful for the incredible experience and expertise that is reflected by the panelists today. So joining us is William Goyce, President of Migrant Forum in Asia, Mi Young Park, Chief of Mission for the International Organization for Migration Vietnam, Shuba Sekar, Director of Human Rights Eurasia and North Africa, the Coca-Cola Company, and Mark Blick, CEO, DigiNext Solutions. As those of us here today know, the UN Global Compact is about mobilizing a global movement of sustainable companies and stakeholders to create the world we want. This mission feels even more vital now that a global pandemic and growing social discontent have highlighted so many of the weaknesses in our institutions and systems, leaving many populations, especially minority and migrant populations, struggling for survival. To realize this mission, the Global Compact supports companies to do business responsibly by aligning their strategies and operations with human rights and to take strategic actions to advance broader societal goals with an emphasis on collaboration and innovation. This is what IOM's live session today is all about. Before COVID-19, migrants who make up only 3.4% of the world's population contributed nearly 10% of global GDP. I hope that good that has already come from global current events is that there is greater appreciation for the outsized and vital role that migrant workers play in all essential sectors, from harvesting the food on our plates and producing the communication devices in our hands to the medical professionals currently at the front lines. Promoting the rights of migrant workers will, will contribute directly to achievement of the sustainable development goals from the elimination of poverty, economic growth, to achieving sustainable cities and communities, and so much more. We must also realize that we cannot achieve recovery from COVID-19 nor global goals without the essential contributions of migrant workers and businesses that respect them. Our speakers today will shed valuable light on how this is possible through listening and responding to the needs of migrant workers, aligning strategies and operations, and leveraging collaboration and innovation. So on that note, let's start today's discussion. William, recognizing that Migrant Forum in Asia is a regional network of non-government organizations, associations, trade unions of migrant workers, and individual advocates in Asia who are committed to protect and promote the rights and welfare of migrant workers. Could you please open our discussion by sharing more on the prevalence of migrant workers within and from this region? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Tara, you. and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah? All right, great. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to be part of, of this panel as well. Just, just to start off, uh, we have um, migrant workers in the region, and when we talk about migrant workers in the region, you have to think of the spread of the region with the largest number around 40 million plus just in the Gulf region alone, kind of, uh, 40 million uh, from, from the region itself. And a large concentration uh, concentration of these migrant workers are in the Gulf countries, the GCC countries. But then you have other corridors as well. You have Japan, South Korea, the East Asian corridor. And then you have the Southeast Asian corridors as well, which is... Uh, uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, kind of thing, and uh, with this kind of spread, and you have you have the spread of migrant workers from workers in the informal sector right up to uh, workers in the formal sector. So you have that whole diversity spread where from from domestic workers to pilots, and incidentally today is International Domestic Workers Day as well. Migrant domestic workers, day. Uh, but. Um, and this is where we are in this region. When you look at the numbers, it's enormous. When you look at countries of origin, it's growing. In the, they're used to, there are new countries of origin coming on board in a much bigger way. And in traditional states like India, you have new states coming on board. So you had, of course, the traditional states like Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and things like that. But now you have new states coming much, much from the north 
new states coming on board as labor deploying states and largely again to the gulf countries you have the strengths of these different countries of our region also in terms of and when i'm saying strength in terms of bargaining power in terms of having uh, policies and regulations for protections of their workers varies from maybe uh, philippines being at at the top with with very strong protection measures for its workers and then you have countries like uh, bangladesh and nepal which have seemed to have weaker bargaining power and then you have with india the state levels of variance among states uh, where you have a state of kerala which has very sophisticated laws and policies and programs and then have new emerging states from india uh, like bihar which would have very uh, not not enough kind of regulation and protection and even mechanisms so it's not all it, it's it's it, it's very very diverse in that in that regard you have different processes in the region which bring together states to learn from each other in this practices but it's a long way before we actually get some some kind of standards and some kind of common thing or common practices that would uphold the rights of migrant workers or protect the rights of migrant workers in the region some of these processes are like the abu dhabi dialogue you have then you have the colombo process you have the asean forum on labor and migration you have the bali process and not to say there's there's not enough of these global and regional processes out there for for states to kind of learn and 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 um, and uh, uh, bring up their kind of uh, standards for the protection of their workers but in very many cases at least among countries of origin we have seen it's largely a race to the bottom of the barrel in terms of how migration is become such a uh, how states have become so dependent on the deployment of migrant workers and largely in the uh, in the low skill sector the low wage low skill low wage sector almost like an economy of scale in terms of deployment for remittances but i I'll, I'll, i'll stop there briefly well and and thank you for that william i i really appreciate you not just highlighting the prevalence and the sheer scale of movement of workers in this region from this region to others uh but also that you started to talk about systems of protection and mechanisms that are in place to consider this um from the experience of your members can you tell us a bit a, a bit more about why these protection measures are necessary uh why um in what ways are migrant workers exceptionally vulnerable to exploitation forced labor or even trafficking look i think it starts from the very first process itself i think there's so much of hype in countries of origin uh there are schemes like a uh, fly now pay later kind of schemes where uh, people can uh, take loans from uh, from loan sharks from uh, from agencies from uh, even from government kind of banks like in bangladesh where you can take these loans and then you can uh, begin your process of going overseas kind of thing very often workers don't know what they are getting into so that we've done a lot of work on contract substitution we we've, we've beaten the drum on this for years about workers not knowing what is on their contract a recruiter telling them what is in it not having the contract in their own language going abroad finding that it is not what they had expected either in wage conditions of work or accommodation there's always some variance from what was explained to them in the contract or told to them and they are not being seen that having seen the contract and then having no choice but to take it or come back home and they've already invested too much in that journey to even think of coming back home so it just begins so as you and you take as you when you go along that step then then you come into the conditions of work accommodations the hours of work and things like that there's so much that is not known and even if known in the sense of told by the recruiter or by the agent or 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 even in a pre departure orientation about life in, in a country in a destination country the variance between what you've been told and what you expect what you expect and what you actually experience in the country of destination there is a very very big variance and this is the biggest challenge because at the end of the day in countries of destination the support systems that you would necessarily have like let's say trade unions or associations of migrant workers these in many countries are disallowed or there is no space for them so in a certain sense a worker goes out and goes out there on his or her own and then has to go into this whole element of survival kind of thing so i think this is the biggest challenge we find and it starts with withholding of documents 
uh, the threat of withholding of documents. There are already laws that says, and companies have put in regulations that say you cannot withhold documents. But we have been told that it's a practice that continues even till this very day. And that withholding of documents is like hangs over a migrant's head. If you if you if you ask for those documents or in any way you require request for those documents, employers threaten that oh, you, you can get undocumented or we put you in an irregular status. And to avoid that, workers just continue to uh, believing that, okay, it's safe and nothing is going to happen. So it's that, it's wage theft that happens. A lot of work people, we, we get this constantly, and I will speak later in the second round about the wage theft campaign that we have uh, launched kind of thing, because this is, a, this is a very big thing. The number of cases that we get on a daily basis throughout the year on just workers not being paid and not being paid not for a month not being paid for two months three months six months to that scale kind of thing and i think it's important to look at those vulnerabilities and then there's the gender dimension of these vulnerabilities as well you know it's how many uh, it's not it's gendered it's ethnicity it's nationality there's a whole cross section of where you are coming from what your background is that increases or puts you in, in situations of vulnerability in the workplace. Great. Thank you so much, William, for shedding a bit of light on, on so many factors that make migrant workers vulnerable from pre-departure through their migration to when they're actually employed at the workplace. Um, if I can turn to you, Mia, could you build on what William has been saying about the vulnerabilities of migrant workers, but maybe focus a little bit from the experience of IOM on what is it about their mobility? What are some of the root causes or drivers behind this vulnerability? Okay, thanks for the invitation, Tara. So at IOM, under our general labor, labor migration work and our migrant protection work, we partner with various stakeholders and we look at the entire migration journey. So from their home, when they're seeking employment during recruitment process, on their travel to the destination country, at the workplace, and then back to the place of origin. And each stage of migration process, there are risks involved. And due to the vulnerabilities just discussed by William, we see that migrant workers are more likely to be exploited, their labor rights abused, and their human rights violated. And what we've identified is that often, problems start from the very first step. The unethical recruitment practice in the countries of origin so even before they start moving. So I'm, I'll be echoing what William said, but it's very important that there are three main risk areas. First is excessive recruitment costs that leave many in debt bondage. So recruitment costs is basically fees and costs incurred for workers to secure employment. So this could include transportation, visa, medical checkups, uh, orientation, training, accommodation. So most of them are legitimate costs, but the issues are that first, they tend to be excessive and inflated, but most importantly, second, that they're charged to the workers. And we've seen cases where the recruitment costs workers had to pay was double the amount of their annual income. So many end up being in debt bondage, which leads them to be financially incredibly vulnerable. Second is deceptive recruitment practice such as multiple, you know, triple contracts with different terms and condition and often in languages that they don't understand. And I've seen contracts signed by the same person with two different salary amounts and very different. And many of migrants do not even get paid the amount they're told. Some don't get any, any income at all. So these practices lead to workers being really informed, uninformed, confused, exploited, with no place to turn to for help or clarification. Third is restriction in movement. And this happens during recruitment phase. So I'm not talking about restrictions in movement at the destination country, which is also serious. But this happens at the recruitment phase, that their passports and personal documents, bank documents are taken at the recruitment. So they can't drop out of the recruitment process and look for other options. And this ultimately leads to situation where they're not able to walk away from exploitative working or living conditions at the destination country. You know, I would say all of us here and those listening and would never pay 
to secure our own employment. We would never sign multiple documents. We would never give our passports or bank accounts to our companies. And if we were demanded, we would think that that's it's absurd and we would simply not accept it. But unfortunately for millions of migrants, these are widely used practices. And so often they have no choice but to accept them. And some believe that they cannot even question them. In addition, as, as William said, host governments and companies often are not aware of these practices and also because they don't see migrant workers as their priorities for protection, there are lack of regulation, and even if there are laws and policies, they are not very implemented and, and, and enforced well. And you know this is just at the recruitment phase but maybe most significant because once you start under an exploitative condition, it's very likely that you will end up working in an exploitative situation at the destination country. So just to sum it up, the inherent vulnerabilities of being migrants and then the discrimination, inequalities and weaknesses in labor migration system makes them exceptionally vulnerable. Thank you, Mia. Um, you and William have painted quite a dire picture. Uh, there are a lot of vulnerabilities associated with highly complex processes. What can business do to mitigate these risks? So the only way I think for businesses to mitigate these risks is to recognize and understand that it is in their interest to own these issues and take the lead. You know, they can approach this from the risk management perspective, you know, the, the reputational risk, the direct financial risk associated with them, or maybe from the corporate responsibility perspective that it's a you know, right thing to do, it's a moral thing to do. But practically, as employers, companies want healthy, qualified workers, those who are hired lawfully in a fair and transparent manner, those who have clear understanding of your business, your expectation, the terms and conditions of their work, and those who generally want to work for your companies. So to ensure they can recruit such productive workers and also manage their risk, a number of things can be done. First, companies need to better understand their migrant workers' vulnerability and their own industry's specific risk. They need to take actions to make their own recruitment practice in their supply chain more transparent so they can see what's happening. And I'm not just talking about first tier supply chain, but the entire second and third tier uh, labor supply chain. And they also need to be familiar with regulatory frameworks, international standards, and good practices. And this will help them develop their own specific policies and guidelines. And once they have good data and framework, it's very important that they make sure that this is well communicated and that they're actually applied in the management system and ensure due diligence and provide close oversight to the employment practice. Of course, setting up grievance and remediation mechanism that actually can be accessed by the migrant workers will be needed. But of course, this is a lot you know, easier said than done, which is why under the CREST initiative, which is, stands for Corporate Responsibility for Eliminating Slavery and Trafficking Initiative, IOM supports companies to conduct supply chain mapping, develop guidelines. We also have toolkits available for brands, employers, recruiters to carry out due diligence to conduct ethical recruitment. We also provide training on the subject as well as direct assistance to workers and pre-departure, post-arrival orientation and training. And I think all of these efforts are even more important during COVID and post-COVID area. The restriction in mobility, high unemployment rates, and poor economic situation make migrant workers seeking employment even more vulnerable and desperate. You know, they may resort more to using unqualified, unlicensed agencies, use irregular channels to uh, channels run by smugglers, or also online virtual fast track procedure may be encouraged by companies as they need to quickly hire workers and labor inspections and audits may be reduced and all these will further increase risk. And we're already seeing an increase in trafficking cross borders in several reasons. So we really believe that it's important than ever that companies take actions 
to end the current business model that exploits migrant workers. You know, migrant workers should not pay to secure their employment. Recruitment related costs and fees should be borne by the employers. And if employers own these costs, recruitment agencies will have to ensure that they provide cost-efficient, cost-effective, competitive quality service to their clients, which are the companies and the workers. And ethical recruitment is in the interest of employers and companies. It will help with their productivity, sustainability, and credibility. And the good news is that brands are starting to recognize this and actually are taking actions. But of course, this cannot be done by business alone and governments, civil societies, you know, unions, recruiters and workers and international agencies like IOM, we all have a role and it would work better if we work more in partnership and collaboration to make the real meaningful change. Sorry, that was a bit long. No, but so important. And it was helpful that you articulated so many of the principles that are behind ethical and responsible recruitment. Uh, and I'm delighted that we have one of the brands that you referenced that has made a commitment to ethical and responsible recruitment on this call. So if I can ask Shuba, uh, you know, the Coca-Cola company has made this commitment. Could you tell us a bit around what were the benefits that Coca-Cola saw behind making a commitment to ethical recruitment and maybe just more about the journey that brought you to this space. Uh, thank you, Tara, and greetings to everybody from New Delhi, India. Um, so, you know, as, as uh, uh, pointed out by my, the other speakers, that uh, you know, the, the migrant, foreign migrant workers are at the extreme end of the global inequality spectrum. Uh, many of them are victims of modern day slavery. They, this issue was there before the pandemic and it has become worse, uh, you know, with the crisis. Uh, so we started uh, focusing as a company uh, on this area uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere in 2007. Uh, so we have an extremely robust, uh, you know, auditing, uh, third party auditing process. And we started picking up issues. And this was before, you know, the just legislations came like the California transparency, the modern slavery. So the, in the kind of uh, understanding, you know, in early days was limited. So uh, what we first started doing is really, uh, you know, getting to the uh, nuts and bolts, understanding it by virtue of a study. When we understood the dimensions of this uh, problem, we kind of updated our policies to expressly prohibit uh, forced labor and human trafficking in our uh, in our supply chain. But of course, that is policy. But we went on, you know, to take several other steps to bring that policy into practice. One area, of course, has been pointed out, which leads to debt bondage, is the recruitment fees. At times, it takes workers two to three years to pay back those fees. So this is one of the major causes as pointed out. And so we enhanced our safeguards uh, related to recruitment and ethic, you know, ethical practices. And these safeguards were built into our, uh, you know, protocols and policies and, you know, our, our, our auditing, uh, you know, uh, process. Uh, we each year conduct about 2,000 audits in, you know, all our workplaces worldwide. Uh, you know, we've done about 25,000 um, third party assessments to date. Uh, but not stopping at that, you know, because we have a due diligence approach, we collaborated, and I think this was pointed out by uh, Mia, uh, that, you know, it's extremely important to collaborate because this dimension is huge. Uh, so we kind of got collaborated with four other organizations to launch the leadership group. Uh, for responsible recruitment, uh, for promoting ethical recruitment. This is with IHRB, which is the Institute for uh, Human Rights and Business, the ICCR, the Interfaith uh, Center on Corporate Responsibility, the IOM and Verity. And now as an active member of the Consumer Goods Forum, we also publicly committed to the three principles, that is no passport uh, retention of the workers, no recruitment fees to be paid by the workers. And the third is no contract substitution. Um, so we, we've kind of, um, you know, also hugely focused on capability building because it's not enough for us to understand. It's extremely important to build the capability of the supply chain constituents. So through CGF, through other forums, and also uh, in the individually as a company, we've kind of, uh, you know, uh, invested uh, a huge amount on uh, building capability and making, you know, the, the constituents understand the dimensions of this issue and what is in it for uh, all of us and like pointed out, you know, 
as a responsible company, uh, which has been there for several uh, several decades. Uh, you know, it's, our reputation is extremely important. We believe in doing the right thing. Uh, we take a rights-based approach, and uh, you know, we have embedded this in our way of doing business. So, uh, you know, we kind of uh, make sure all our partners also understand our values and our commitments. Uh, thank you, Shuba, and and it's wonderful to hear about about how you are trying to articulate your values and realize them through all of these important commitments. And I'm going to come back to you in a little bit to hear some more examples of how you are trying to take this work forward. Uh, but before I do so, I'm going to turn to Mark. Uh, Mark, could you tell us briefly about the next solution and how can you see the potential for technology to overcome uh, challenges that companies may face in trying to implement ethical recruitment practices. Thank you, Tara, and uh, thank you for hosting this panel, and hello to everybody online. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with DigiNex Solutions, we are, we are a data infrastructure company. Um, so what that means is we collect, we surface, and we share data, typically amongst the complex ecosystem of stakeholders in a more direct and hopefully impactful way. We have a core focus on, on social governance indicators and combating forced labor. Um, and what, we, what we're really believing in is transparency and greater immediacy um, driving, driving, driving meaningful change. I think from a technology perspective, first off, it's important to view technology as, as just a tool in terms of getting all the relevant stakeholders working together and providing the right incentives for participation, which is typically either around efficiency or, or security. Um, so answering a question of how does this make my life easier or how does this make my life safer? Um, and ultimately, whilst technology is just a tool, what's most important is the practitioner. And the practitioner being the hiring manager, the recruitment agency, the government official, the United Nations, civil society, the brand, or of course, the migrant worker. Um, and what we're looking to do and have been doing um, is connect all of these different stakeholder groups together through those three core actions. So the collection and surfacing of data, um, enabling the ability to audit and investigate that data. Um, and then finally, um, giving a platform through which people can report and publish that information and data to relevant parties. And ultimately, what we're looking to solve for, and I think... Um, blockchain can be condensed down to this single statement is I need to know what I'm looking at is what you're looking at. Um, and given this framework, we're, we're extremely focused on three or four key things, which is creating digital tools to help eliminate the exploitation of vulnerable people involved in the migrant worker ecosystem, um, reducing friction and inefficiencies in the current offline recruitment process. Um, and uh, William, I noted your points around fly now, pay later, and loan sharks and education around that. And that's something we're very focused on, particularly in Bangladesh right now. Um, providing scalability to reaching the last mile issue. Um, so it's, of course, working in, at the factory level is, is important, but I think as we've all mentioned here, being able to reach far upstream past the township into the, the uh, past the recruitment agents into the broker level of countries of origin is important and connecting with hundreds of thousands of potentially or remote potential migrant workers. Um, and then ultimately bringing transparency in, in human labor migration, um, which in turn um, encourages good behavior. Great. So it, it sounds like technology, specifically blockchain, really has the capability of, of building trust, creating or strengthening accessibility, increasing efficiency, and, and like you said, scalability. Um, so, Shuba, if I can come back to you, uh, could you tell us a little bit about Coca-Cola's experience with adopting of new technologies to try to strengthen your efforts in the space of ethical recruitment? Um, sure, Tara. <clears throat> While focusing on, uh, you know, the, the, the three principles of ethical recruitment and, you know, doing our due diligence in our workplaces uh, around the world, we kind of came across two aspects. One is that the issues arise uh, not in the, you know, not, uh, of course, there are some aspects which happen in the workplace, in the receiving countries, but there's a lot that happens from the villages that we start, from the sending countries, right, the countries of origin. And the second is that the auditing and due diligence doesn't reach the contracting level. 
So that's several steps. I mean, um, as, as, as we've mentioned, there's a whole, uh, you know, network of recruitment agents, which kind of make uh, a worker, you know, from his village reach uh, the workplace um, in, for and therefore, we were looking at, uh, you know, how can we address this issue? And we were uh, exploring uh, leveraging technological solutions uh, to drive social impact and supply chain transparency and accountability. Uh, so last year, uh, towards the middle of last year, we piloted uh, an initiative using blockchain in the Middle East uh, with our bottling partner, uh, Diginex, which is our uh, technology uh, you know, provider, and with guidance from IOM, uh, where, you know, specifically focusing on contract swapping. Uh, so as, as explained by Mark, there is, you know, there is a registry where you, you know, put in the documents and it's, it provides an extremely secure, uh, secure uh, framework, uh, you know, which cannot be tempered with. Uh, now this app that it has, was developed also has various built-in functionalities. So, uh, you know, we also saw whether it, uh, it could capture information like passport retention, what is the kind of fees that the worker has paid, uh, where they've come from. So there's a whole lot of flexibility that, you know, uh, uh, a responsible business can work with to ensure that, you know, they're capturing this information. Uh, now, we, you know, in this, in the bottler uh, facility where we piloted it, we went uh, and, you know, along with Diginect actually got the feedback, which was good. They found it easy to use because it was in their phones. They had the documents that they needed. The human resources uh, teams, which also are the interface, you know, for uh, when the worker gets onboarded, they found it, you know, seamless and easy to use. In fact, you know, they were very happy and they actually wanted to kind of upload a lot more contracts than we uh, initially planned, you know, when we started the pilot. Uh, however, to demonstrate the full potential, uh, you know, to really enhance the transparency, we uh, also needed to uh, onboard the recruitment agencies and the workers in the uh, country of origin, which was what we had planned for phase two of our pilot, which unfortunately because of COVID had to be a little delayed, but we do intend to, uh, you know, restart it once the situation allows us to do. Um, so uh, that, you know, will help us get an end-to-end -end kind of model, which we can present for scaling up, you know, and we can also present to other uh, interested uh, partners. No, th thank you so much for sharing more about that. I am uh, I um, I really appreciate how it sounds like a, a highly consultative and participatory process went into into tailoring this tool so that it was right for the workplaces, for the workers, and for the labor actors by extension. Um, so looking forward to hearing more about this from you after phase two. Uh, but maybe just to go back to Mark at Diginex, um, would you like to add from, I know that uh, Diginex has been doing work in this space, uh, you know, across sectors, across countries. Would you like to add more from your experience in actually implementing this technology with workers, with recruitment actors, with employers? Yeah, very much, very happy to. Um, so, uh, I mean, first of all, thanks to Tuber and Coca-Cola for being such wonderful partners on this project. Um, and I think we developed fantastic learnings from it and, and look forward to continuing to engage. Um, through EMIN, and we started this journey around two and a half years ago, um, looking to create human-centric tools to help um, prevent or at least combat. Initially, it was around contract substitution, as William mentioned to begin with. Um, and that document handling component of our work remains very critical and has also now expanded to include other documents, such as visas, medical certification, and evidentiary documentation around fees and salaries. Um, um, we've also begun allowing employers to send documentation, um, for example, health and safety policies that you need to demonstrate to external parties that people not only have received, but have acknowledged and read, um, as well as tracking things like training hours. Um, something that came up repeatedly is um, migrant workers were not always aware when they were going through a formal training session because it could be baked into things like an onboarding session or weekly meetings, so being able to track those hours and then again report that either internally for sustainability purposes or externally to the local Ministry of Labour or whomever it may be. Um, so on our, additionally, on our original project, um, which was working with Burmese migrant workers on Thai shrimp farms. We were looking at five mostly demographic data collection questions. And that was, that was our theory to begin with, that you couldn't ask any more than five questions because otherwise people would get bored and not want to participate any further. Um, this has now expanded up to 35 different questions covering both demographic and social governance indicators um, that can be used to identify and combat potential cases of forced labor, um, as well as for both internal and external reporting. Um, 
and we're able to complete this document document verification work and collect responses to these 35 questions in around six minutes, um, primarily through, through mobile. Although we have found that both region and demographics can have a significant impact on, on, on user um, preferences, as we experienced with, uh, with Schuber and Coca-Cola in, in the Middle East. Um, having collected, um, having provided responses to those questions, we're now also enabling ongoing engagement with workers, both pre-departure and also post-arrival on an ongoing basis. So if a worker has responded a specific way to a specific question, well, of course, they have the, the ability to remain, remain anonymous if they wish. Um, but then if they don't, the employer has the ability or the brand has the ability to follow up uh, and, um, and request further information or evidentiary documentation or just to clarify responses. Um, so this, this data collection part, in addition to the document handling, um, is proving very combating and very powerful in combating potential cases of false labor or, or certainly increasing education, just awareness of, of, of where operational efficiencies might benefit from a greater level of transparency. Um, if we also look at the project um, that we have with UTAR and IOM and uh, Mia, I'm going to raise your CREST acronym and give you IRA SAFER, which is International Recruitment System um, Self-Assessment for Ethical Recruitment. Um, we spent a whole afternoon coming up with that. <laughs> uh, um, looking to promote ethical standards amongst recruitment agencies globally in line with the IRIS principles. And of course, as Shubra has mentioned, it's not only the work that we do with corporates, but also being able to engage with recruitment agents who have demonstrated their adherence to principles like these. And, and the platform in and of itself is looking to do three things, which is um, um, allow or enable ongoing engagement um, with recruitment agents um, post-training and right up to certification. Um, so recruitment agents can understand those areas where they, they need to they need to focus on. Um, able to identify ability to identify areas where IOM can lean in for capacity building, either on an agency level or on a principal level. Um, and then thirdly, um, provide data around recruitment agencies that IOM can use for um, policy advocacy. And so ultimately, again, it's around collecting that information, surfacing that information, sharing it, and publishing it in an appropriate way. Um, um, but also gain transparency and time efficiency in the way that the process is happening. Thank you, Mark. Um, I, uh, I get really excited when I think about the potential for tech. Uh, I also get a little bit nervous because I think there are um, some scary bits in terms of uh, you know, concerns about data protection and accessibility, uh, but, but it sounds like um, uh, that the processes that go into developing these tools are, are highly considerate of that. Um, now, I, I'm happy to say that, that we, um, we have time to sort of open up our discussion a little bit more. Uh, and it looks like, oh, we, we do have a question. Um, so one question is specifically for Shuba and Mark. And the question is, how has the collaboration been received and supported by the suppliers and the recruiters in the supply chain? So have you, are there any lessons learned that could be shared? Uh, it would be really helpful to all of us. Yeah, so uh, thank you for your question and for the interest in, in the work that we are doing. As I explained that this, you know, this, what we did uh, was the phase one of the pilot, which was uh, basically in our uh, bottling plant in the Middle East. We had we were planning to do phase two, which is which uh, you know uh, involved getting the recruit you know recruitment agency on board and the workers in the country of origin. We couldn't do that as yet. We had to pause because of the you know the the pandemic. Uh, so we haven't yet at this stage uh, taken this pilot to our uh, you know the suppliers and others. We wanted to first get test out an end to end model um, and then you know understand what's going well, what can be better. And then once we have that model, then we wanted to take it to scale, uh, which at that point would mean that we take it to our other bottlers and to our uh, suppliers. So, I mean, please watch, watch the space. Hopefully we will be able to share some good learnings, you know, as and when we're able to start this work. We will. Mark, do you have anything to add from other experiences with adoption from supplier and recruitment partners mm -hmm. using uh, new tech solutions? So, um, um, yes, I think um, 
suddenly when we've learned the hard way that when we introduce these types of projects, we, we, we play down the new tech solution part. Um, and it's um, our, our learnings. Our first project, I think we've done quite well in identifying how this might be useful for a migrant worker. And I think we had done quite well in identifying how this might be useful to the head of sustainability in a, in, in a large corporate or brand. Um, I think we have learned over time um, um, that key demographic of the operations manager, the HR manager, the factory manager, how this may be useful for them. Um, and it's typically around efficiency gains on, on a, what might or might not be a, a paper-based process and how this might mean that they can go home an hour earlier rather than an hour later. So if we go back to the original point, it's um, looking to solve generally for two things. Um, how does this make my life easier or how does this make my life safer? And hopefully both. Um, and, and I think positioning it that way um, it has generally been fairly well received in, in the projects that we've worked on. Great, thank you. Uh, I actually wanted to go back to you, William, because you gave a bit of a teaser earlier about some work that Migrant Forum in Asia is doing on uh, wage theft. Would you like to tell us more about that? Well, yes, uh, just to say that uh, it was uh, about uh, just about uh, 12 days ago, we launched an urgent appeal. Uh, this was launched together with Migrant Forum in Asia, Lawyers Beyond Borders, the South Asian Trade Union Council, Solidarity Center, and the Cross Regional Center for Migrants and Refugees. Five organizations came together to launch this because as Migrant Forum in Asia, because of the COVID, we were receiving a lot of information about workers being laid off and uh, being repatriated. I, and this was an, uh, you know, swings between uh, right to return where workers wanting to come back home to deportations of uh, undocumented migrant workers and repatriations of the uh, workers who had lost their jobs. And also we were looking at this big flow of workers coming back. But uh, in the process, many of them complaining of not getting their wages not getting the end of service benefits, not getting their dues that were due to them. And then we started looking at numbers uh, in terms of the repatriations that are happening. For example, the government of India and the UAE, when it started a registration uh, process for all those who wanted to be repatriated, 200,000 people signed up on the first day itself, kind of thing. The system practically crashed. Of course, this means not all of them are workers. Some of them are family members. Some of them are tourists who were stranded and things like that. But still, it's a large number of workers within that pool. We are easily looking at something like a million plus migrant workers from Malaysia to the Gulf who will be repatriated in the next few months. That process has begun, you know. And a large number of these workers are complaining about not getting their wages and not only businesses have taken advantage in some cases of the COVID where they have not been paying workers for months before the COVID. And now because of the COVID and the loss of business and things like that, I'm making this as an excuse of sending back workers home kind of thing. And uh, the thing is governments will give them a helpline, banks will give them helpline and they will start from scratch again. We wanted to raise this issue up for uh, issue because we believe that the, the enormity of this, the scale of the wage theft in the time of COVID is so high, and that's why the urgent appeal calls for an international justice mechanism, largely because the existing justice mechanisms, the remedy mechanisms that were there in countries of origin, in normal times could not cope with the workload. Uh, that, uh, with the cases that they were getting, you know, and, and that was, and, and they were hugely inefficient. Countries have tried, like, for example, Qatar tried an exp expedited court procedure. UAE tried a mobile kind of clinic in Abu Dhabi, kind of uh, uh, mobile court kind of thing in Abu Dhabi. This was all before the COVID. But a large number of them were not able to address just the volume of cases they get in a normal time. And now with with, uh, with COVID and the repatriations, this has grown exponentially. And that's why the call has been to look into this, to, to, to look into the wage step, just because I know the World Bank said 20% drop in remittances, and, and that's big, that's more than, you know, 400, 450 million kind of thing. But uh, when you look at it, it's not, only the, it's not only the drop in remittances, it's this, what is owed to workers, the potential remittances that could have been a helpline in this time 
have now been cut off kind of thing and this is this this is the seriousness of the gravity of the crime kind of thing and that's why we we called and and it has gained traction now there are a huge number of international organizations that have endorsed the call international trade union congress has endorsed the call business and human rights center has endorsed the call equidem the global unions federations uh, pwi and public services international human rights watch a number of we had dialogue and thankfully with iom as well with ilo with the world bank to see how they could come in we are talking to countries of origin to see how they will take this up and that's and that's the and that's the sad part about it is is that in in this covid has affected everyone yes but to look at the disproportionate vulnerability of migrant workers in this who have always been victims of wage theft how that has grown exponentially i will grow exponentially because of these repatriations in huge numbers the irony of it all is countries of origin who are asking migrant workers to register for repatriation flights are not collecting data on whether you have lost your job whether you have paid been paid your wages whether you have been given your dues they are not even asking that on the forms these forms are online you can check it out on their websites embassy websites they are online they are not even asking that countries of destination are not doing the due diligence to say okay we are you are going back do you have any grievances do you have any claims do you have unpaid wages to collect so none of this is being done you know and it's a whole almost like a scam of just sending workers back kind of thing and that also workers having to pay for their flights kind of thing who have not been paid wages are now being asked to pay for their flights in in, in uh, they are also being asked to pay for the testing in some cases the country like nepal is asking for its workers to pay for the testing before they come back to nepal how are workers going to pay for the testing when they haven't paid for their wage been paid their wages so the situation at this point in terms of vulnerability and desperation is high among workers who are and of course in within this situation and this is where forced labor and things will come in is that many workers will also uh stay back even if they have lost their jobs and not been paid because because what is the option coming back home you know so they will stay back because some countries have extended the visa limits kind of thing uh, the expiry limits and also some have said they're going to stay back and see if they can get another job or they can get alternative employment or employer and things like that so it's there's there's a lot of issues within this kind of urgent to feel that we have reached and we are asking for both countries of destination and countries of origin not to let this pass by because this this is not the legacy we want of the covid and how the issues of migrant workers were addressed in a pandemic that in this time you had the highest exponential increase in terms of wage theft in in terms of just the amount of money that is that that will that will not be paid that is that is due to workers thanks Um, now, th- thank you, William, for raising this really important issue. Uh, there's a clarifying question for you: of the expected returns in the coming months, is there a sense already if these are mostly returns of migrant workers whose contracts were completed and not renewed, or are they terminations of ongoing employment contracts? Is there any is there any available data or a sense of this? Look, I, uh, the data process is only. they yeah, we've only just begun collecting we are only as amp collecting cases of workers who have lost their jobs and that mm-hmm. already is a high number you know so they uh, uh, i'm sure countries of origin must be collecting other kind of data with regard to uh, other situations of migrant purpose but this already is high the, that uh, the number of people who have lost their jobs and uh, it's not only that it's like a, for example malaysia recently announced uh that uh, no more hiring of foreign workers in the wholesale sector so in the fish market and things like that but these were workers who already had jobs and you make an announcement that no more hiring within so all the workers who were in that sector suddenly lost their jobs and these were documented workers you know so it's like workers it's this this whole challenge that migrant workers today have and we will see it we've only begun to see the i think this whole repatriation process is going to continue for months into uh, up to the end of the year we've only begun to see the first trickles and so far it's already close to 100000 that have come across uh, come back but these numbers are definitely going to uh, going to increase as the repatriation flights become more frequent and as regular flying 
uh, as, as uh, airlines open regular mm -hmm. corridors. No, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there's another clarifying question from you, William. Uh, uh, the question is, is Migrant Forum in Asia getting reports of reverse remittance flows from communities of origin back to family overseas due to them being stranded or um, stuck without employment? We are, we are, a lot of our workers, a lot of our workers, uh, at least in the countries of origin, a lot of our members have uh, said about uh, workers uh, asking from their families uh, money for existence, livelihood, you know, just, just food and that kind of support, asking for testing or asking for, for the flight to come back home and things like that. Uh, as MFA only yesterday, we made a commitment because workers cannot um, cannot pay for the testing even uh, before they have, before they board the flight and it is compulsory that they should be tested before they board, board the flight so we try to see if we could raise the resources for workers who are in that desperate situation who want to come back home because there's no 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 chance of them continuing in the country of destination but who wants resources just to do that flyer just to do that test to uh, the, the covid test kind of thing so yeah. There is there is a call from workers, and we are now trying to raise resources for that reverse remittances to to send to workers who are in that desperate situation. Uh, a lot of our members during the COVID were already involved in this kind of campaigning, kind of thing. So it's uh, it's 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 very much the case. It's very much. The case. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I'm noticing the time, and so I think I'd, I'd like to bring this sort of to the, the last section of our discussion today, which is where I, I would like to ask each of our speakers to sort of what's one key takeaway you would like for, for viewers of this session to take away, or what's one recommendation uh, to business for how they can strengthen their efforts to be responsible moving forward. Um, and, and, and William, I might actually start with you in case there's, in case you have an ask for business related to your current campaign or, or anything else. I think Mayor, uh, well, one is with regard to the current campaign, I think it would be good to see how the business sector endorses the campaign, sees this mm -hmm. as a legitimate and urgent appeal to endorse. Uh, it would be great, like how Mia said, to look at the supply chains. I'm sure many of these companies that are now firing workers would somewhere fall within second tier, third tier supply chains. It would be important to look at that. It would be important to look at subsidiary companies that come up uh, and, and hire migrant workers that survive around primary companies kind of thing, you know, like small small and medium businesses that, that set up next to a factory because that factory is there and because they target the, the migrant worker population within that factory. So I think for businesses to come out and see that, 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 that environment for, for, for protection of migrant workers, for, for safe working conditions of migrant workers, I think this is going to be important. The last thing I would like to say is for businesses and this Singapore has brought out very clearly in the time of COVID, it's not only about working conditions. Singapore was smooth sailing that it had addressed its uh, COVID uh, cases kind of thing till suddenly they discovered clusters in the accommodations of migrant workers and then they recognized that it's impossible to, uh, to do social distancing and the, the, the measures that needed for protection against uh, against the virus kind of thing uh, for migrant workers just because their accommodations were, 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 were would not allow that. So it's more than just working spaces, it's about even living conditions for migrant workers and businesses within the supply chains have to take accountability for that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, William, for making these really important recommendations and, and concrete things that business can do. Um, I'm going to disrupt the order and go over to Mark. What, what would you like your final words to be? Oh, can't hear you, Mark. Um, thank you, Jara. I think I'm, I'm particularly excited about the work that Shuba has mentioned earlier on, on the end-to-end -end, um, transparency of a migrant worker's journey. Um, the work we've done so far has been either in country of origin or in country of destination without linkage between the two. And I think this year, once we can all get on things again, um, we look forward to joining up those two and providing that transparency and, and looking at tools like online training for skills and certificate issuance and checklists for items required as working overseas um, prior to departure along with 
things like peer-to-peer -peer verification of documents among trusted um, uh, uh, social circle members, uh, and creating non-sensitive public records of a person's work history that could be used later in other opportunities. Um, and the work that we're doing around those types of features and functions in country of origin, and then connecting it through um, all the way to um, a, a factory in the Middle East or somewhere in Southeast Asia, um, where we're doing that um, fairly rapid social governance data collection around those indicators that I mentioned earlier, and the contract verification and, and, and fees, evidentiary documentation, salary receipts, and so on and so forth. Um, um, so working with partners like, like Shuba and Coca-Cola to, to join those two ends up um, and get transparency all the way from from a broker in a township and, and, and more educational um, um, in initiatives all the way through to the governance, data governance collection process in, um, in a factory. Great. Oh, and, and of course, work agreements is linked to that entire journey. Excellent. I'm glad you got that final very important point in. Uh, Shuba. Shuba, do you have any final remarks? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I would like to stress on the importance of use of technology as you know for businesses for due diligence process because I think due diligence is extremely important and one has to constantly keep doing it. Uh, it I think the COVID and you know what the world presents uh, going forward shows that you know we need to have basket of tools, uh, one of which is, you know, using of technology. But technology alone can't be a solution, right? I mean, uh, that's only a means uh, to the to the end. And so uh, I would like to, I, I think, once again, reiterate what came out earlier, the need for, uh, you know, partnerships for collaborative action to really make it something which is scalable and sustainable. And if we look at the ethical recruitment agencies, we need to make their business viable. Right. If there is just one or two who are looking at ethical recruitment, it's not going to be viable and it's it's going to fall apart. So it's important for like-minded businesses to come together to build density so that, you know, the whole uh, recruitment process is also viable for them. So we need to look at this whole thing holistically, uh, really, to be able to move the need. Thank you, Shuba. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Mia, final words on behalf of IOM. So as I was preparing for this uh, this session, um, I remember I heard a quote. I think it was from a play. I didn't read the play, but I think it's about workers and migration that said, we asked for workers and we got people instead. And I thought that really summed up the migrant worker situation quite well. You know, maybe because we see migrant workers only as um, important labor and not as human beings, that we unconsciously or consciously, we let their very fundamental rights and freedom be ignored and neglected. And that we've somehow accepted that it's okay. So, you know, how we define an issue and the value we place on it determines how we address it. So maybe we should start with recognizing what we're really talking about here. This pandemic has seems to have humanized the economy that, you know, behind the food we take, uh, the products we consume, you know, the service we use, there are people and it's the people who run this economy and run this society. So I would say if there is one takeaway, so at least let's commit to making sure that no one pays for their employment. And at least, you know, we could commit to ethical and responsible recruitment for a start. But since I'm the last person, if I may make one more point, because it kind of reminded me when William was talking about this is the situations that migrant workers were in. Because migrant workers' experience is very complex. It requires it, it involves multiple states, you know, multiple stakeholders and people that no one, no one uh take responsibility and say, you know, it's the company or it's the host country or it's the sending country, but we all have a role and we must play our role and we must do it in collaboration and partnership to make the real change. I wanted to add that. Thank you. I can't think of better words to go out on. 
So thank you so much, everyone, for your incredible contributions to this really important discussion. And thank you for your ongoing efforts to promote the rights of migrant workers. Um, so yes, thank you again, everyone. Thanks to thank all of you, you who joined today. Thank you so much and stay safe, take care. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.